One year ago, days of rain led to months of recovery. Back then, much of our area was underwater, and tonight there are areas still reeling from those relentless rains. Tonight we begin our look back, check in with people today, and examine the lessons learned from the power of Mother Nature. We begin our look back with ABC 15's Erin McPherson. Four rounds of rain hit our area last October from Thursday, October 1st to Monday, October 5th. When it was all over, more than 20 inches of rain fell in some parts of Ori and Georgetown counties. This is the bad as we've ever seen it. I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. We've had tropical storms and hurricanes come through, but many say October's historic rainfall and flash flooding was much worse. The way the water is now and fast as it's coming, it's coming a lot faster than it did in Florida. I was here for Hurricane Hazel, which was 1954. I was here for Hugo in 89 and a few other minor ones in between, but those weren't on the scale of the water. Streets were flooded. It's uh, two to three feet around the corner, maybe four feet in some spots. Normally you can stand right where we're at. The water's up probably three foot. Many left stuck inside their homes. Like being locked up in jail. But refusing to let the water put their lives on hold. We're going to travel back and forth by boats, just waders, kayaks, any way we can. Keeping the floodwaters out just barely. We have a pond in our backyard and under our house. It's just come all the way to our front door and to our back doors, um, but thank God it's, it's never come in. Others, not so lucky. As we were leaving, the water was about to my knees. The water just kept pouring in. The water's got basically under the house. Um, you can't live in it. It has an odor. It's indescribable. I can't even put it in words. We had um, standing water for almost three days. We had an indoor fish tank. Flooded streets, damaged homes, and thousands of dollars lost from local businesses. When I got back to my store, it was eight inches of water flooding inside my store. Beds floating, pillows floating. You know, the paint on the walls coming off. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of loss. I mean, I have a foot of water in my, on both of them stores, and we, we shut it down, that's it. In the difficult time, people came together. Seeing if anyone's in distress, uh, just seeing if people are out about uh, moving stuff around, um, and then just motoring up and seeing if we could help in any way. We will come together as, as a people, and we will uh, make sure that everyone who's affected by this flood is actually um, taken care of. All of the rivers crested between October 8th and 12th, days after the rain stopped. It took nearly a month for all the rivers to fall below flood stage. Here at the Waccamaw River in Conway, flood stage is 11 feet, but during the historic flooding, it hit 16.2. That's the third highest on record. In Conway, Erin McPherson, ABC 15 News. So, so many people affected by so much rain, but as uh, they were talking about in that story, so many people came together too to help. They sure did. Our chief meteorologist Ed Piotrowski was on the air around the clock during the flood and tonight he takes a look back at what made the 2015 flood so historic. The catastrophic rain event that occurred over four days last year was the result of a very unique weather pattern that set up over the southeastern United States. Here's how it unfolded. We had a cold front moving through early on October 1st. It settled to the south of us. That allowed cool, dense air to settle into the Carolinas. Meanwhile, we had a huge area of low pressure developing over Georgia, and this low pressure cut itself off from the main flow of the jet stream, which basically means it sat here for three or four days, pulling deep tropical moisture out of the Gulf of Mexico out of the Caribbean Sea and off the Atlantic Ocean. That moisture riding up and over that cooler and denser air was literally wrung out as very heavy rainfall across South Carolina. In addition to that, the area of low pressure helped to kick major Hurricane Joaquin out to sea. No direct impacts here, but that circulation with that low so strong that it was able to pull some of the tropical moisture from Joaquin and pull it into South Carolina. Of course, that helped to enhance the very heavy rainfall across our area. The end result was a tremendous amount of rain especially across the southern half of our viewing area where 20 inches of rain fell from Sumter to Johnsonville down to Kings Tree and over toward Georgetown. Obviously lesser amounts the farther north you go. Here's a look at some of the incredible rainfall totals in our area. Nearly two feet in Georgetown, Longs, and Kings Tree. Over 20 in Sumter, Darlington, Myrtle Beach, and Andrews. A foot and a half in Carolina Forest in Conway and in Lake City. And as you go on down the list, over 15 inches in North Myrtle Beach and Florence. 
Bennettsville had nearly 12 inches of rain. We were not alone though. Other areas had tremendous amounts of rain as well. The highest total in the state, Mount Pleasant, over 27 inches of rain, over 15 in Columbia. When you take all this rain and you spread it out evenly across the entire state of South Carolina, we would have had 10 inches covering the entire state of South Carolina. That is incredible. To put that another way, that's equivalent to one 20 ounce bottle of water for every American for every day for the next 310 years. I can't even comprehend how much water that is. It's a tremendous amount that came down in South Carolina. How rare is this event? It's considered a thousand year rain event, meaning on average this occurs once every thousand years. And to put that another way, that's equivalent to just a 0.1% chance of a rain event like this occurring in any given year. So that means we all experienced an extremely rare rain event that produced flooding unlike anything we had ever seen before. And the devastation along some of our rivers was just unimaginable. Up next, we'll check in on recovery efforts along the Grand Strand and in the PD. Now we turn to the PD where floodwaters took weeks to recede. While insurance covered some damage, residents soon learned it wouldn't come close to paying for the losses they experienced. In times of trouble, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, used to say, look for the helpers. You'll always find people who are helping. And that's what we did. Here's ABC 15's Tanya Brown. Laura Florence County suffered some of the worst flooding in our area. Roads disappeared underwater and Lynch's River overflowed its banks. The water flowed into neighborhoods like First Neck Road in Johnsonville. Nearly 600 houses damaged and destroyed. It was just an incredible uh, disaster that we had seen and nobody could see the way out. Currently Lou Palm chairs the Florence County Long-Term Recovery Group and yeah. works with the American Red Cross. He saw much of the devastation firsthand. And we told the residents of the Johnsonville Lake City area all our long-term recovery group was, could give them was hope. That's all we could give them. The long-term recovery group is made up of people from different agencies. They're tasked with helping flood victims get back on their feet. It was very devastating. Going into the homes, no heat, no water. It was just a lot to, to, to grip. It was an unbearable situation for many families because they couldn't get enough help from FEMA. Many tell me they were forced to stay inside their flood ravaged homes. Mold became under their houses. And when the mold came under the houses, I've had a few people that got sick from the mold. But there was light at the end of the tunnel. The need for hope continues. Don't give up hope, but there is progress being made as well. To date, the long-term recovery group has raised $150,000 to help 100 of 570 flood victims so far. We have not had a ton of cash, but we have leveraged that cash with the help of the North Carolina Baptist uh, mission. The North Carolina Baptist men are volunteers. They're rebuilding homes and giving people hope. I do it for the love of the Lord. He He's blessed me and my family so good. And me and my wife feel like we were called to help others. Others, like Thomas Gray III, heavy rains damaged his roof and his floors. You can hardly walk in the house. We had to kind of pick spaces to move around. Lou Palm tells me they have many success stories like Gray's, but still have a ways to go. We're perhaps at mile 14 in a 26 mile marathon. In Laura Florence County, Tanya Brown, ABC 15 News. So good to see so many people coming together to help. And that rising water forced homeowners to trade their submerged cars for boats and canoes. Some of those homeowners remain out of their homes to this day, while others are just getting back in. ABC 15's Liz Cooper revisits Georgetown County. 
Where I'm standing is about a quarter of a mile down the road from the Black River. There was so much water here last year that these trees were nearly consumed. This house along the road was nearly completely underwater. All you could see was just a little bit of the rooftop. One year later, this family here and so many in the Georgetown County communities are still trying to rebuild their memories. There was so much debris, we couldn't get in here. We had to move so much. Signs of devastation linger. Warped siding, stained, dirty windows. It's what remains of Denise Bratcher's home in the Big Dam Swamp community in Georgetown County. The outside, still visible scars from the historic flood. The Black River crested on October 8th last year at a little more than 20 feet. Three days after that, Bratcher's neighbors took us on a boat ride near her house and along the Black River. This is what Bratcher's house looked like then. Oh my gosh, what happened? Where's the house? Is it all there? So many questions she had when she saw it herself last year. It was not a good feeling. But nearly a year later, there's healing inside. The cleanup continues for Bratcher. Power was restored just two weeks ago. And air conditioning finally running again a few days ago. We're not the only people not in their house. There's people right down the road who just got back in their home. And then here we are not there. A number of communities along the Black River were hit hard. Pam Plexico and her family own a home in the Browns Ferry community. We were really in denial for a very long time. Even when it got to what, a foot and a half, two feet below the porch, um, we still on the back porch, it's not coming in. Their home consumed by floodwaters. All you could see was their roof. It still hurts. They were able to rebuild. Others were not so fortunate. Along the Black River, you can see empty lots with overgrown weeds where homes used to be. There were two homes there and they're gone. The Plexico say they struggle with survival guilt, knowing so many people are worse off than them. Some have still not gotten in yet. Um, some will never rebuild. They'll never come back. Both of my neighbors are gone. Kevin broke down at one point off camera as he talked about the nightmares of floodwaters sweeping away their lives again. Too scary to deal with. It's horrible thoughts and dreams that haunt them even more today. For me, it's been the, the anniversary, I think, has been the hardest part of the entire thing. Those who suffered and lost pieces and their whole lives say time will heal. Time will fix things along the river and, you know, just like it goes in and out, so does the troubles and so do the tears. Not forgetting those who still struggle one year later will also help them persevere. In Georgetown County, Liz Cooper, ABC 15 News. Just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. well, Georgetown was one of 36 counties declared disaster areas. To date, statewide residents and communities have received more than $164 million from FEMA. Despite the misfortune that many felt, a deep sense of community grew from that disaster. Next, we take a look at the importance of those relationships and see how emergency management agencies are applying what they've learned to be better prepared in the future. The Rivers taught emergency management officials valuable lessons. Tonight, ABC 15's Crystal Costa talks with emergency management officials who had to deal with some of the worst the flood delivered. The October 2015 floods hit Florence County hard. If we were here during the floods of October, we would have to hold our breath because we would be underwater at the moment. Emergency Management Director Dusty Owen says better knowledge of river levels wouldn't have stopped the water, but it would have helped them plan. Here at the Lynch's River in the center of the county, flood stage is 14 feet. 
This is the only place in the entire county where a river gauge monitors the water level. We had reached the highest point here at 19.73 feet, but it was almost two days later before these flood waters impacted fully the Johnsonville area. The water flowed south to Johnsonville, where there's no flood gauge. Upper Florence County doesn't have one either. Owens realizes now what a difference having three gauges would have made. It doesn't have to be of historic proportions for it to impact citizens. Um, you know, even smaller floods do flood out homes, they do close roads, they do have impact. And that flood gauge would be able to give us a warning when that's fixing to occur. Georgetown County also suffered from a lack of river level gauges during the flood. When the flooding started, they had none. Temporary gauges were installed, but those are now gone. Emergency Management Director Sam Hodge and his team have talked about buying four permanent gauges, but they're about $15,000 a piece. It costs just about as much annually to monitor and do maintenance on the gauges as it is to buy the gauges. And that was kind of um, a number that we really didn't expect. Now Owens and Hodge are trying to secure funding for annual maintenance of flood gauges, a process they say could take a while. Also taking a while, the long road to recovery. The sheer number of volunteers and nonprofits that came here to help was welcomed, but also overwhelming. So many people want to help, but they're unsolicited volunteers. And we actually have a plan in place to help bring those unsolicited volunteers the, the families that would just show up wanting to help, but we put them with another agency and get them trained up. Both Florence and Georgetown counties have long-term recovery groups that began working to pair flood victims with organizations that can help with everything from federal assistance to actual home repairs. They're still, you know, continuing on as of today and probably next four or five weeks down the road or months down the road, they'll still be facilitating these groups. Owens and Hodge developed strong relationships with the organizations that came in to help and also strengthened relationships with existing agencies like DNR, the National Guard, and other emergency management departments. I think the relationships have to be focused on simply because they are so critical in not only a flood response, but in the response to any type of disaster. Both Owens and Hodge hope the rivers never flood again the way they did in October, but they tell me in the face of another disaster, our counties are better prepared to respond. That's because of what they learned about our rivers, recovery, and relationships. Crystal Costa, ABC 15 News. To understand the impact the flood left on our state, just take a look at the numbers. 19 people died. Two of those were in our area in Horry County. More than 500 state roads and bridges had to be closed. There were more than 1,500 water rescues. 20,000 people had to leave their homes and more than 2 million emergency meals were served. When we come back, we have a final look at how we overcame the tremendous losses. I sit down with Governor Nikki Haley as she reflects on how the state pulled together. Of course, this wasn't just a disaster in our area. It affected the entire state. I recently sat down with Governor Nikki Haley to talk about how she responded in the weeks after the rains fell. 2015, particularly starting from the spring on, was a, was a tough year for South Carolina. It was a brutal year, yeah. On the heels of what happened in Charleston, we get these torrential rains in early October, and it just seemed like for anybody who lived through it, it wasn't going to stop raining anywhere in the state. When did you realize that this was turning into a situation that was going to require a lot of attention? Well, a good week before, we watched these systems pretty close. So a good week before, we were watching it, but we were planning on a hurricane. You know, we weren't planning on anything else. And so um, everything that we did was getting ready, getting all my agencies ready for that hurricane. Basically, it wasn't a hurricane anymore, but it was gonna be a bizarre rain event, and that's all they could tell us. And they were saying 15 inches, 17 inches. It was 24 inches in 24 hours. After all of the rain finally subsided, when we were driving through Columbia Sunday morning, 
I mean, my only thought was how many people did we lose? Because it was just so much water. And then it was after that, um, you know, meeting with all of my agency directors twice a day, basically living at the emergency management division for two weeks, then making sure we went out on the road because we didn't want people to have to find us. I imagine you met many, many people who were in really, really dire circumstances. What's, is there a story that sticks out more than another to you? There was one Team South Carolina day and we were all in a line and we were filling food boxes. Um, with supplies and there was a sweet woman next to me and I said did you not have any damage in your home and she said no I lost everything I said what are you doing here she said because if I don't have anything God would want me to help other people that's the kind of people that were out there I want there was another woman we went to and she was at a FEMA table and she was crying and I asked her I said are you getting everything you need and she said you know I've spent all of my adult life volunteering and helping those that were in need. She said, I never thought I'd be on this side of the table. And I said, well, then now it's time for us to help you. What would you like uh, South Carolinians to know about preparedness and about being ready for something like this? That when I stand in front of a podium lesson, you know, I mean, it's, I, I say that um, with a smile, but the truth is when we go and we do a press conference, it's because it's serious. You know, take that seriously. You know, speaking with the governor, I really got the sense that she was really impacted by this disaster and the people she met, like the two stories she told there about all the people around South Carolina, how they dealt with it, and how they recovered from these floods. Yeah, it impacted state officials. It impacted us in the media, sure. as well as everyone in the state. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for joining us as we remember that historic flood that tested our resources and our resolve. Throughout it all, what we remember is how that moment in our history brought us together as a community, how we remained Carolina strong. This is a life-threatening situation given the tremendous amount of rain we've had over the past 48 hours and the tremendous amount we're going to get as we move forward. It is just water, water everywhere in some places as far as the eye can see. We are getting a new look at some catastrophic flooding that hit Columbia. From the air, we'll see the devastating images of a storm that literally tore apart the central part of our state. But despite the horror stories, we have found enormous strength in those living in the tattered communities. South Carolina has gone through a storm of historic proportions. Everything's gone. It's just gone. Everything we had. This man and his wife lost everything. Their 10-year-old son comes up to me and says, this is devastating. And to hear that come from a child really put it in perspective because it's not just adults who are going through, it's the children too. Y'all need some food? Thank you so much. Hot mess, but blessed. And there's a lot of damage and destruction there, and this water will go to help those people. We will come together as, as a people and we will uh, make sure that everyone who's affected by this flood is actually um, taken care of. And I want to remind you that South Carolina may be bruised, but we are not broken. The morale is good of everybody that is working very hard and the passion is strong. Um, you know, you can push South Carolina, but boy does South Carolina push back.